Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, this afternoon's session is, uh, as I said, a, uh, a tribute in honor, in honor of, of Oliver Atkin. Um, for those of you who uh, never had the, the good fortune to meet Oliver, uh, he was sort of a, a singular point in mathematics, I think. Uh, Oliver was, was uh, quite entertaining, and uh, he was very um, obsessed, shall I say, with the, the numerology of number theory. In fact, I was thinking during, during Kristen's talk that he would have really loved Look, looking at those factorizations of the coefficients that she gave, he probably, un, undoubtedly, he would have gone off muttering to himself and come up with a, with, with, with a good modular explanation of what's going on. But uh, that's only my speculation. Um, Oliver was one of the real pioneers in computing and number theory. I mean, from the time when uh, computers were laughably primitive by today's standards, uh, Oliver was doing some rather non-trivial computation. And um, he didn't have that, all that many students, but I think he did have actually a, a great influence on, on, on the field of elliptic curves and modular forms, each of which were his personal friends, I think. Uh, he was interested in lots of other things, uh, in particular uh, related, in particular he was interested in primality testing, which the uh, shy and retiring Dan Bernstein will speak about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Let's do a microphone test. Am I audible from the back? I see a thumbs up. OK. Uh, my first encounter with Oliver Atkin was in 95. I was applying for a job at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I was nervous. I was 23. I uh, was giving a talk and, and realizing as I was giving the talk, oh my god, there's all these people in the audience who, who uh, don't do number theory and maybe I should define a number field. And so I, so I quickly give a definition of a number field instead of just saying some things about it. And for instance, Q adjoins square root of minus one uh, of degree two and Q adjoins zeta 19 of degree 19. Now, as soon as that second 19 came out of my mouth, instantly, very loudly, from the back of the room in a, some sort of British accent, there was a hmm? <laughs> I said 18, excuse me, and I continued with my talk, and I got the job. Uh, a few months later, Oliver had his retirement conference. And yeah, as Victor mentioned, he was very funny. He, he stood up at some point and explained that retirement, of course, he would continue working. A, a retirement simply meant that he would no longer have to talk with students about anything less than cubic reciprocity. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have a uh, few of his papers uh, mentioned here. Um, I, I actually uh, thought I might spend the hour just quoting things he said. I, I, I will resist that, but I will give um, one entertaining quote here. Uh, the whole subject of primality and factorization has had an extraordinary fascination for me since the late 1960s when John Brillhart, John Selfridge, Dan Shanks, Dick Lamer, and many others introduced me to it, both in person and in print. I was no stranger, he wrote, to primes in computation, but these had previously arisen only as the eigenvalues of HECA operators, and were certainly all less than one million. And he goes on to say how in, in primality and factorization, uh, the major influences on the subject in the last two decades, uh, again, he was writing this in 95, this is from the Intelligent Primality Test Offer paper, uh, the major influences on the subject in the last two decades have been the use of elliptic curves by Lenstra and the increasing number of applications, in particular to cryptography. And, and then he says, these influences increased the audience for the subject and so necessarily decreased the level of judgment and professionalism. <laughs> For some peripheral observers, this fact has obscured the novelty, beauty, and often simplicity of the ideas. I, I figured that I would spend the hour uh, giving a few examples of things that uh, um, maybe in a few cases I'll go a bit beyond what he said in his papers. And um, I hope that the things that I say that are beyond the papers are things that, if he were here, he would have enjoyed. So first of all, recognizing primes. Oops, skip the Carmichael for the moment. If you want to prove, for instance, that this 314159265358979323 is composite, you can just apply the contrapositive of Fermat's little theorem, computing 2 to the n, this number is n, 
compute 2 to the n modulo n, subtract 2 from it, and you end up with, well, some number which is visibly not 0 modulo n. And Fermat tells you that if n were prime, then 2 to the n minus 2, or in general, w to the n minus w for an integer w, would have to be 0 modulo n. And this is a great way of proving most composite numbers to be composite. But there are some numbers which seem prime from the perspective of Fermat's little theorem. These are the Carmichael numbers, which thanks to Alfred Granville and Pomerantz, we know uh, there are infinitely many of these Carmichael numbers, numbers where w to the n minus w is 0 modulo n, even though n is in fact not prime. So what do you do to get a more reliable test? Well, you start factoring w to the n minus w. For instance, if w is any integer, n is, let's say, an odd prime. Pretty easy to tell whether an even number is prime. Uh, if n is an odd prime, then either w or w to the n minus 1 over 2 plus 1 or w to the n minus 2, uh, n minus 1 over 2 uh, minus 1 or more than one of those has to be 0 modulo n. And the proof is simply, well, Fermat's little theorem says w to the n minus w is 0 mod n. And w to the n minus w is a product of the three functions that I just mentioned. So at least one of the factors has to be 0 modulo n. And well, that's the conclusion. Now, this is more reliable than Fermat. You can keep going. For instance, if n is 1 mod 4, then you can factor w to the n minus 1 over 4 minus, uh, sorry, factor w to the n minus 1 over 2 minus 1, which is where I got to a moment ago factor that into two pieces. It's again a difference of squares if n is congruent to 1 mod 4. And then you get a more reliable test. The, the end result of continuing in this way is from Art Uhov in 1966, who said in general, if u is the number of powers of 2 in n minus 1, then you keep factoring n minus 1 into, well, w to the n minus 1 minus 1 into as far as you can go with powers of 2 in n minus 1. For instance, here's a proof that 2821 is not prime. Uh, if you take 2 to the 14, 10 plus 1, 2 to the 705 plus 1, 2 to the 705 minus 1, modulo 2821, then they're all not 0. But wait a minute. The product of those is 2 to the 2820 minus 1, which would have to be 0 if 2821 were prime. So 2821 is not prime. All right, that's our two of's test, and it's actually very, very reliable. Um, the standard theorem is that if n is an odd prime and you apply Artyuhov's test for a random choice of w between 1 and n minus 1, it's got at least a 75% chance of proving that n is not prime. Of course, if you apply it to a prime, it will never prove that n is not prime. Uh, try a bunch of choices of w, enough that the 75% chance keeps piling up. If you try, say, log base 2 of n or ceiling of log base 2 of n choices of w, then standard conjecture is that this reliably recognizes primes. If trying all these choices of w in any reasonable pattern, if that fails to prove that n is composite, the only way that can happen is if n is prime. There's all sorts of people. I'm not going to try to trace who exactly is responsible for the uh, pieces of this. This is the current typical way of checking that a number is prime or proving that it's composite. How long does this take? Well, I've told you to try log n log base 2 of n choices of w, choices of potential witnesses to n being composite. How long does each of these w's take? Well, you have to do some exponentiation modulo n. You have to do something like log n bit operations to multiply mod n. And then you have to do log n multiplications to do an nth power. And then you have to do that log n times for, for log n values of w. So that's log n cubed time to do all of these exponentiations. You can try to speed that up. Maybe log n cubed is not the fastest way to reliably distinguish prime numbers from composite numbers. For instance, you could try doing only square root of log n choices of w. And that would reduce the time to log n to the 2.5, quite a lot faster than log n cubed. Except it doesn't work. There are certainly numbers that pass this test with only square root of log n choices of w. And the reason is that you can easily write down lots and lots of numbers n where that 75% is actually quite realistic. For instance, here's one of the atkin larsen examples. And I think they were the first to write this down. The whole paper was about three pages long, essentially saying that all the previous papers on the topic were stupid. But uh, one of the points that they made in this paper was that if you have any n of the form 4k plus 3 times 8k plus 5, where those are both primes, then you will have about a quarter of the possible w's, in fact, making n seem to be prime when, in fact, it is clearly composite. 
if you look at how many n's there are and you think about how many w's you'd have to try to get rid of all of these n's to make the test succeed for all these n's, you see you have to have something at least close to linear in log n for the number of w's to try to, to exclude all of these composites. So what do you do instead if you want to try to improve on log n cubed? Well, you could try a quadratic extension of z mod n. Instead of looking at the multiplicative group of z mod n, let's look at, for instance, z mod n adjoin t in the middle here, z mod n adjoin t, where t is a root of t squared minus wt plus 1. Now, I've put a hypothesis on w here to force this to be a field, namely w squared minus 4 having Jacobi symbol minus 1 modulo n. If n is prime, this is the Legendre symbol, w squared minus 4 is not a square, and then, well, that polynomial, t squared minus wt plus 1 is discriminant w squared minus 4, which is not a square mod n. So this is, in fact, a field extension. The test you do is, well, if n is an odd prime, and you compute t to the n plus 1 over 2 in this field, then you will get 1 or minus 1. Again, assuming w has the right symbol. w squared minus 4 has the right symbol. And the proof to be complete about it, first, well, as I just said, from w, you, you know that this extension is, in fact, the quadratic field extension of z mod n. And now, what does that tell you about t to the n? Well, t is certainly a root of this polynomial u squared minus w u plus 1. By construction, t squared minus uh, w t plus 1 is 0 in this field. Now, taking nth powers, t to the n is also a root. But certainly, t to the n is different from t, because in this field, we know all the uh, numbers whose nth powers are themselves, and t is not one of them. Uh, so this polynomial has two roots, t and t to the n. Therefore, factors is u minus t times u minus t to the n. And then looking at the constant coefficient, you see t to the n plus 1 is 1. And therefore, t to the n plus 1 over 2 is 1 or minus 1. And that's exactly this test, which is a typical Luca style test. Reinterpreting the computation here, this is counting the number of points on a certain curve. I'm working with powers of t, which has norm 1. Well, let's look at all the elements of norm 1 in this extension. Let's look at all the y plus xt's that have norm 1. In other words, that have x squared minus wxy plus y squared equals 1. That's some curve. It's a shifted, twisted circle, clock, if you like. Uh, on this curve, well, the, the computation I just did is counting the number of points on this curve. It's exactly n plus 1 under the same assumption about w. The number of points on this group scheme evaluated at z mod n is n plus 1 by this hypothesis on w. So if you multiply n plus 1 by any point, for instance, 1, 0, this is if you take t to the n plus 1 power, you will get the identity element, which is 0, 1. And now that, well, OK, aside from dividing by 2, getting uh, the neutral element or obvious point of order 2, uh, this is exactly the same test that I wrote down here, which uh, OK, it's, it's fun to have curves running around, but what's the point? Is this actually better than the original test? It's, it's not, actually. It's, it's certainly not faster. It's somewhat slower. Uh, it's maybe more reliable. Well, if you look at it, no, it's not more reliable. There are just as many failure cases for this test as there are for the usual test. So then you say, well, OK, that attempt to apply mathematics was uh, not improving the situation. Let's put in some more. Let's have an elliptic curve. For instance, let's take x squared plus y squared equals 1 minus 30x squared y squared. There's a nice genus 1 curve. And hey, genus 1 must be better than genus 0. And then uh, assuming you know the number of points, which was a, the critical calculation here was figuring out the number of points on this x squared plus y squared minus wxy equals 1. Assuming you can figure out the number of points on this new curve, modulo n, then you can do the same kind of test. So take some random element of this group, this, this group scheme at z mod n, and multiply it by the known number of points the known number assuming that n is prime. And then, well, if n were composite, it would have an awfully difficult time having the presumed number of points times some point here coming out to be the identity element. This is what the Chudnovsky brothers and Gordon proposed in the mid-'80s, building the elliptic curve E with complex multiplication only in the class number one case. Of course, we now know how to do this very efficiently for higher class numbers. I'll come back to exactly how fast that is. But again, there's no point in doing this. This is not better than z mod n star. It's not more reliable. Well, if you look at how reliable it is, you, then you see that these elliptic pseudo primes for, for doing an elliptic curve primality test are just as frequent as uh, regular pseudo primes or quadratic pseudo primes. So there's no point. 
what do you do to make a better, faster primality test? Well, this is the subject of Atkins' 95 paper. You try to combine different tests. You try to say, instead of doing a lot of Ws for Z mod n star, or doing a lot of Ws for this uh, x squared minus Wxy plus y squared equals 1, or for some elliptic curve, you start varying which groups you're working with. The first proposal along these lines was from Bailey and then Pomerantz, Selfridge, Pomerantz, Selfridge and Wagstaff, who said take one quadratic test and one linear, well, one z mod n star test. The total time to do those two tests, each one of them takes quadratic time. So doing two of them takes quadratic time, essentially. If you compare that to doing two w's in the original test, it's much, much, much more reliable. Even now, there are no counterexamples known. There are no examples known of numbers n which are composite and which are not proven to be composite by their test, filling in the details of exactly which w's they take. If you can find an example, you get $620, of which I believe uh, $20 are um, from Pomerantz because he thinks that there are lots and lots of counterexamples. I'll come back to that. Uh, and then Atkins said, well, OK, OK. Linear and quadratic is not enough. Here is a really confidence-inspiring test. Do a linear test, a quadratic extension of z mod n, and a cubic extension of z mod n. And he, he goes to some effort to make a cubic extension, which allows really fast computations, and offers $2,500. This is no longer open for a counterexample. I mean, we don't know any counterexamples, but if you find one, you don't get $2,500. Um, Pomerantz's argument about the linear and quadratic tests was published in 84. Actually, it was at, I believe, Aryan Lenstra's PhD defense. Uh, he wrote a little paper saying, here's how Aryan can make some money, can make $620. At the time, it was a slightly smaller amount. But to get Aryan off on a, a, a good financial footing, he could try to construct counterexamples counter to this test. And Pomerantz explained how to do this. And the same explanation should also give lots and lots of counterexamples to Atkins' test. So it's actually, there should be lots and lots of counterexamples. But actually, obvious thing to do is keep going just a little bit, where the little bit grows really, really slowly with n. I think if you take something much smaller than log n, I'll quantify this a little more precisely in a moment. If you take something far smaller than log n tests, well, log n to the epsilon test, where epsilon converges to 0 with n, then I believe that this sequence of tests becomes perfectly reliable. So if you take Atkins' intelligent primality test and keep going to a superintelligent, and you know, a quartic, quintic, et cetera, then you'll get something which is a perfectly reliable test for primality that takes only, essentially, quadratic time instead of, essentially, cubic time. Now, I, I'm not sure if this analysis, the analysis I'll show you in a moment, has been done before. So I, I put new in question marks for this conjecture. It's, it's a pretty easy analysis to do. Uh, at the same time, I've seen people who are speculating that the best possible primality recognition algorithm takes essentially cubic time. So uh, the quadratic time conjecture does seem to be new, at least to a bunch of people writing papers in this area. Uh, further comment, which I'll also come back to, is that if you want to make this run as quickly as possible, not just get the exponent down to 2, but get the little o of 1 as small as possible, then you certainly should not be doing degree 20, degree 21, et cetera, extensions. You should be doing a bunch of those elliptic curves. Being careful to not combine a bunch of curves which all have the same number of points. Gordon's test always had n plus 1 points. No point in combining those. You want to have a lot of orders which have a large least common multiple. But uh, that's easy to do. What does this conjecture come from? Well, Erdős, in 1956, this was the basis for Pomerantz's analysis. Erdős said there should be infinitely many Carmichael numbers because there should be infinitely many numbers n for which n minus 1 is a multiple of p minus 1 for every prime p dividing n. This is how you force w to the n minus 1 to be 1, modulo p, is you force p minus 1 to divide n minus 1. So unless w is a multiple of p, certainly w to the n minus 1 will be, well, w to the p minus 1 times something, which is 1, modulo p. And if you manage to do that for every p dividing n, then, well, you've made a, a, an n for which w to the n minus 1 has a, a very good chance of being 1 and then good chance of passing all the tests you might do with z mod n star. 
what's the chance that n actually gets through this? Well, if you think, suppose I've got n where I know it's got a, a p times some other stuff. I fix a p and then say I've got n is p times some q times whatever. Then what's the chance that n minus 1 will be a multiple of p minus 1 or maybe close enough that you'll have a good chance of w to the n minus 1 being 1? Well, basically you want some event of n being 1 modulo p minus 1, which has chance 1 over p minus 1, maybe a little bit more for, for allowing, say, p minus 1 over 2. What if you allow p to vary? Well, these aren't independent chances. Because if you look at the 1 over p minus 1 chance for each p, the chance of all of those happening is not 1 over the product of p minus 1. It's 1 over the least common multiple of p minus 1. This was Erdős's central insight that there's going to be infinitely many Carmichael numbers, that the least common multiple of p minus 1 does not have to be very big. You can have a whole lot of primes p where p minus 1 is a product of very small primes. So you start with a, a set Q1, which is all the primes up to 100, 1,000 million, pick some number which grows slowly. And then take all the primes P up to some bound, such that P minus 1 is a product of a subset of those small primes, primes up to 1,000. Now you've got a bunch of primes P where the least common multiple of the P minus 1s is actually, well, guaranteed to be at most the, the product of all of the elements of Q1. Now, that's not very big. And that actually gives a good chance that if you form a lot of different n's from these lot of different p's, and then look for each of those n's is n minus 1 divisible by the least common multiple of the p minus 1's. Well, is it divisible by the product of all the primes in q1? There's actually a very good chance of that happening, uh, at least enough of a chance that when you look at all the n's over all the p's, then uh, it actually does happen very frequently. So Erdős conjectured there are h to the 1 minus epsilon Carmichael numbers up to h. And that uh, still hasn't been proven. but at least we know there's uh, h to some constant power. Pomerantz attacked the linear and quadratic test by saying, well, let's instead of just having one set of small primes q1, let's have one set of small primes q1. Say uh, every prime that's uh, 3 mod 4 will be in q1 uh, up to, say, 1,000. And then every prime that's 1 mod 4 up to 1,000, we'll put those into q2. And we'll have p minus 1 being a product of, the, of any subset of q1 and p plus 1 being a product of any subset of q2. And there's actually quite a few primes that satisfy both of these conditions. And then if you take n to be a product of a lot of these different p's, then there's a pretty good chance that n minus 1 will, have, uh, will be divisible by all of the elements of q1, and that n plus 1 will be divisible by all the elements of q2, which guarantees that n will pass at least the simplest forms of the linear and quadratic tests, and has a good chance of passing uh, even the fancier linear and quadratic tests you might write down. If you look at Atkins' test, three tests, a linear and a quadratic and a cubic, then you can, of course, apply Pomerantz's argument. But if you quantify, as the number of tests goes up, if you quantify how big the numbers are that you have to write down for Pomerantz's argument to, to kill this test, to exhibit a composite number that passes a test, then you see, well, at least I did a pretty solid job, I think, for Pomerantz's original analysis. But he wasn't trying for uh, a, a lower bound. He was trying for an upper bound. Still, I, I think this is going to be pretty close to the truth that t is going to be bounded by something times log log n. So the n's that you get from Pomerantz are something like doubly exponential in t. If you have two tests, then already it's so big nobody's found it yet. If you have three tests, it should be ridiculously large. As t goes up, the size of n you need to fool this test becomes, well, doubly exponential in t. I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually, say, log log n times log 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 n or something else that makes analytic number theorists happy. But uh, I, I'm certainly very comfortable conjecturing that uh, I haven't missed so much in the analysis that t is certainly less than log n to the epsilon. That's actually a very weak conjecture compared to what seems to be the case. Yeah? Uh, well, this is coming from n. n is going to be a product of p's, where the p minus 1s all have just uh, each p is exploring a bunch of different primes from the same set q1, which is only, say, the primes up to 1,000. Now, there's a lot of different p's that have p minus 1 being a product of various subsets of those primes. But then the least common multiple of all the p minus 1s is not very big. It's just the product of the primes up to 1,000. So it's just e to the 1,000. So what's the chance that n minus 1 is divisible by that particular product of all the q1s? It, it's, it's a huge number. It's like e to the minus 1,000, which on the scale of everything else happening here means you only have to look at e to the 1,000 different numbers n before you get one that passes that. And only e to the 1,000 
for passing that. So that's, uh, that was Erdős's argument. Uh, this is maybe not the most computationally effective way to construct an n which uh, <clears throat> passes these tests, but it does convince analytic number theorists that there should be infinitely many counterexamples. At the same time, there are quantitative limits on how far this can go. So I do believe that there is a, an essentially quadratic time primality test. What if you don't believe these conjectures? Well, I'll get to that in a moment. I first promised that I would get back to uh, constructing elliptic curves because certainly you don't want to use very high degree extensions. They're much slower to do computations in than working with elliptic curves. So let's say you want to do t tests with t different elliptic curves, or maybe t minus 5 tests uh, with elliptic curves and 5 tests with degree 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 extensions. Um, let me contrast this with what happens in ECPP. In ECPP, we're trying to construct something like log n different curves so that we can find one that has its order being a prime or two times a prime, four times a prime, something like that. Uh, in this context, we don't need that condition. We don't need orders which are essentially prime. That's important for proving primality of n, but that will also slow things down dramatically by having such a big t. Here, t, well, I think it's, it's log n to the epsilon. Let's assume it's, it's log n to the 0.3 at most. Then you can easily generalize the standard shallow ideas for making ECPP construct a curve quickly. You start with a bunch of square roots of small numbers, say numbers up to t to the 1 half. Anything that's substantially less than t will make the asymptotics kind of reasonable for, for the time to do that. And there's a good chance, if you look at discriminants up to t squared or 10t squared, they have a good chance of being t to the 1 half smooth, of factoring into integers up to uh, square root of t which means that from the square roots, square roots are, are relatively slow. Writing down a single square root already takes log n squared time. Uh, okay, doing t to the 1 half square roots, it's t to the 1 half times log n squared time. Once you have some square roots, square roots of all the numbers up to t to the 1 half, you can multiply them together much more efficiently to get square roots of discriminants up to t squared, or I should say negative discriminants down to minus t squared. Now, the time to do all those multiplications instead of uh, the t to the 1 half times log n squared is more like t squared times log n, which, uh, well, for the range of t that I'm talking about is, is much, much smaller than the uh, something times log n squared. That's the bottleneck. What do you do next? Well, do some lattice basis reduction to figure out which of your discriminants is actually happy with your prime, which of your primes is happy with the class group. And then that gives you something like t. If you have uh, discriminants up to t squared, roughly, then you get something like t discriminants that are good for n. Uh, maybe it'll be only t over 10 or t over log t or some such. So instead of t squared, I should be saying t to the 2 plus epsilon for some suitable epsilon. But it's about, t squared is about the right number. And then fast CM, I think Drew is left, but uh, let me point to his very recent paper on speeding up CM. I believe that the runtime that he gets heuristically under various assumptions applied to the situation looks like t squared times log n plus t times log n squared. In other words, the time per curve that we're writing down is something like log n squared. For this range of t, the dominant part is the last part of, the, of this uh, fast CM algorithm, which is uh, kind of merging the class polynomial construction with um, writing down the smallest possible part of the class polynomial um, and then finding roots of it. Maybe there's something better here. I don't know uh, how far this is going to go. Uh, certainly this result from Sutherland is faster than the previous results. Uh, it seems to me that this will be the bottleneck in actually running this primality test for very large numbers. So it's actually a legitimate excuse for doing class polynomial computations, for figuring out better class polynomial computations, for uh, moving from J to Weber, for instance, should actually seriously speed up this primality recognizing algorithm. I don't think I can say the same about ECPP as an application of class polynomial computations, but I think this, it really is the bottleneck. I think it's really the most important step in this algorithm is, is doing interesting elliptic curve computations. All right, suppose you're not happy with all these conjectures and you actually want to prove something. Well, then you have to increase t. You have to look around more and find a curve for which the number of points on the curve 
is something that you can factor so that you don't just check that some point has the order you expect in this group. You want to check that uh, the point has not just order dividing uh, what you expect, but you want to verify that the order is what you expect. So that tells you that the group has to be at least a certain size. And that's what ECPP does. The fast ECPP takes time log n to the fourth. Verifying an ECPP uh, certificate takes time log n cubed. And current project is getting that time down. I don't think it'll be possible to do better than cubic, but at least you can look at the little o of 1, things like log log n factors, and try to get those out, try to improve the constants. So what actually takes the time here? Well, in ECPP, you've heard something already, but just to briefly review, an ECPP proof looks like an elliptic curve modulo n together with some point. This w now is a point on this curve, mod n, which has prime order, q. And part of this proof is recursively verifying that q is itself prime. q can't be too small. The, the proof breaks down if, uh, if q is too small. But uh, the q's that we can actually find are pretty close to n. So this is not a serious restriction. What does the verifier do with this proof? Well, the verifier checks, first of all, that w looks like it has order q, checks q times w, sees is that the neutral element on this curve. Because elliptic curve computations are compatible with base change, you get to reduce this modulo p. And you've done a computation on the elliptic curve modulo p for any prime p dividing n. You know that q times w is 0. So the order of w in e of z mod p is either 1 or q, once you've checked the q recursively is prime. You check that w is non-zero and also non-zero after base change. So w is, for instance, for Weierstrass coordinates, you check it's an affine point for other coordinate systems. You check that, that each of the coordinates is, is different. Well, the difference of coordinates is invertible modulo n. That's what this boils down to. Uh, so you check that w in each e of z mod p, even without knowing what, what p is, do some very fast tests to see that w is going to be non-zero, doesn't have order 1 modulo p in the elliptic curve modulo p. And so now you know for every p dividing n, every prime p dividing n, that the order of w is exactly q. But that means that the size of the elliptic curve group is, well, at least q. And now, knowing that q is, is pretty big, that tells you that p has to be pretty big by Hasse. Specifically, uh, every p dividing n has to be bigger than the square root of n, which immediately implies n is uh, prime. What slows this algorithm down is, first of all, the recursion. You've got um, this recursive proof that q is prime. q is pretty close to n. That you can put more work into trying to find q's and slightly decrease the q's that you find. But you still have to go through something close to log n, maybe log n over log log n levels of recursion to actually prove that n is prime, just because there's all these subproofs involved in it. You have to know that q is prime. The other thing that makes this algorithm slow is that doing arithmetic in the elliptic curve modulo n is slow. For instance, if you take the Goldwasser-Killian definition, which I've written here as the engineer's definition of e of z mod n, this is follow your nose and say, well, I've got, uh, I've got points on the elliptic curve mod n. I don't even know if n is prime, but I'll just go ahead and use the formulas. Here's a doubling formula. So oh, x1 is different from x2. Well, I'll compute lambda equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And whoops, I just divided by something which was not invertible. That's the, the GCD computation. It's doing that inverse, uh, inversion. Uh, and hey, I've just found a factor of n. And if that never happens, if nothing goes wrong, then you know that the computation you've done reduces modulo p. So this computation, uh, sort of looking at the algorithm you're doing, is, is uh, retroactively defining some piece of e of z mod n, which is compatible with e of z mod p for every p dividing n. And then you know something about e of z mod p. I mean, it actually is a legitimate proof, and, and you don't have to think uh, what e of z mod n actually is. You could alternatively come along and say, oh, this is so ridiculous having e of z mod n defined implicitly by what some algorithm is doing. Let's give a proper definition compatible with how algebraic geometers would think about group schemes of what e of z mod n actually is. I'd like to show you the definition. I'll do that in a few minutes. Because um, I, I think it really is a very nice definition and fun to work with. But it still requires that GCD for every computation that you're doing. You could try other things. For instance, in one of Francois's papers, uh, there's using division polynomials, which, as written, don't involve any inversions. But it's something like 20 multiplications per bit of n uh, to do that computation. And that's kind of ridiculous compared to 
what you've heard for even Jacobian coordinates. You can do a, a, an nth multiple in 9 plus some, something that converges to 0, 9 plus little of 1, log n multiplications, where some of these are the time you have to do for batching a bunch of GCDs, checking that everything that you were implicitly dividing by in the Jacobian coordinate formulas is actually invertible mod n. Fastest way to do that is multiply them all together. And you have to do that something like log n times. So doing a, a multi-inversion modulo n costs a significant chunk of this computation. I, I thought a few years ago that I could do better than this with a Montgomery ladder type computation, which almost kills the little o of 1 gets rid of the multi-GCD, reduces the, the 9 to 8 at the end of the day, essentially by killing that multi-GCD. But uh, I wouldn't trust this proof. And if somebody came along to me and said, that's a proof of primality, I'd be kind of skeptical. Um, so fortunately, we know more now. In particular, we know how to do curve computations without exceptional cases and with incredible speed. So. Instead of using old-fashioned curve shapes, let's use x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus d x squared y squared, where d is not a square. And then we know that the addition law, the very fast addition law on this curve, always works. You never end up dividing by anything 0 modulo p. So you don't have to bother checking anything. You do the fastest computation you can think of, and it just it, it, it always works. You've heard what the fastest computations are, and it's only 7 times log n multiplications, plus some little o of 1 for the occasional additions you have to do. That's much, much faster than uh, certainly division polynomials or doing GCDs all the time. Well, it's, this, is, this seems to be the state of the art. Uh, maybe somebody will come up with something better. But uh, this is already pretty good. Except you might object, wait a minute. How do I know that this d is not a square? We're trying to do computations in z, e of z mod n in order to do computations in E of z mod p for every prime p that divides n. Now, how do I know that d is not a square in z mod p? I don't know anything about p. I mean, I think p equals n. We're going to prove p equals n. But that proof can't assume that p equals n. We don't know in advance. We can't assume anything about p. How do you know d is not a square? Well, the easy fix is to say, OK, at least there will be some p that works. Because you take a d whose symbol mod n is minus 1. And that means there's some p dividing n where d is not a square, modulo p. And that tells you that some p, all of your elliptic curve computations have worked. So for some p dividing n, p is at least, well, what you get from, from Hasse. Assuming you've done a, a q, you've verified that something has order q. Now, depending exactly how close q is to n, you have to do a little bit more work to check does n have any small primes. If you know that some prime dividing n is, say, uh, bigger than n over a million, and you know that n has no prime factors up to a million, n has to be prime. Then you can try to balance, OK, what will you allow q to do? Do you want to do more order verification versus doing less trial division? Use better methods in trial division. There's all sorts of things to make this run even faster. But the basic idea certainly works, and that's what we're exploring right now. I promised I would tell you the mathematician's definition of e of z mod n. I'll only do this for, I'll do e of r in some generality, but only for r's with class number 1. But z mod n has class number 1. Uh, this goes back effectively to an inventionist paper by Lange and Rupert, different Lange, uh, saying for any abelian variety over any algebraically closed field, were you writing papers in 85? OK. Uh, for any abelian variety over any algebraically closed field, there's a low degree complete system of addition laws. So addition laws are polynomial expressions which are compatible with addition, except they're allowed to sometimes give all zeros, some non-projective point. Uh, they specifically showed that if you have a symmetric um, elliptic curve embedding, then you get a uh, degree 2 in each variable system of addition laws. Um, I'll, I'll say what this means quite concretely in a moment. Uh, they commented that this proof does not let you write down the addition laws. To determine explicitly a complete system of addition laws requires tedious computations already in the easiest case of an elliptic curve in Weierstrass normal form. But OK, they were not deterred by tedious computations. In the same paper, they actually did it. They wrote down a complete system of three addition laws for short Weierstrass curves, and then a couple years later did it for long Weierstrass curves. 
Uh, I'm not going to show you the formulas, just to give you an idea of how complicated they are. If you give names to some cross products, then you end up with only 53 monomials in the uh, complete system of addition laws. Quite a mess. Until Bosma and Leinster came along and made things much simpler. Um, so what they did, first of all, they reduced the three addition laws to two. So they wrote down six polynomials, x3, y3, z3, x3 prime, y3 prime, z3 prime. The primes are just different polynomials, no derivatives. Uh, in this generic polynomial ring with variables x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, and generic curve coefficients, a1, 3, a6 in Weierstrass form. Uh, what I've shown you on the, on the previous slide in a ridiculous font here is not the system of two addition laws. This is two of the six polynomials. So they had uh, y3 prime and z3 prime. Actually, this is the result. So what I'm showing you is a scan from the printed publication. And the printed publication is not the same as what Bosma had inside his computer from an early version of Magma. Uh, this is what happens when you feed Magma output through the publisher, and you get publish y3 prime and publish z3 prime. These are incorrect formulas, as they actually appeared in print. I said I would say concretely what this means. Well, these polynomials have the following very explicit addition property. If you take any Weierstrass curve, any point p1 on this Weierstrass curve over whatever field, any point p2 on the same curve over the same field, then the first three polynomials evaluated from Boltzmann and Lenstra will be either the sum of the points or 0, 0, 0. And the second system of polynomials they wrote down will also give you either p1 plus p2 or 0, 0, 0. And they won't both give 0, 0, 0. So between the two of them, at least one of them will add any particular pair of points that you feed in as input. OK. Here's a similar theorem for Edwards curves. Instead of in P2, this is in P1 times P1. Uh, this is also geometrically outside characteristic 2. This is arbitrary uh, elliptic curves. Um, so same level of generality as, as uh, this theorem. Uh, the formal expression is, well, it's, it's the same thing, except it's all P1 times P1 instead of uh, P2. There's some explicit formulas, some explicit polynomials that we wrote down, x3, z3, y3, t3 and x3 prime, z3 prime, y3 prime, t3 prime, which always add any pair of points. There might be some occasional 0 divided by zeros, but that'll be made up for by something else not being 0 divided by 0. The, the difference between these kinds of formulas and what you get from a, a well, engineering <coughs> approach to adding points on an elliptic curve is that these formulas will never give you anything bad other than 0 divided by 0, or 0, 0, 0, and more variables. Um, for the normal formulas, if you try applying, say, the doubling formulas in textbooks, then those don't work for adding most pairs of points. They give you actual wrong answers. These are all valid on some open subsets of E times E, or E of K times E of K. Here are the formulas for Edwards curves. That's the complete system of addition laws for addition on Edwards curves with all the extra variables to put it in P1 times P1 and show it to undergraduates. Uh, for comparison, here again is the Bosma Lenstra complete system of addition laws, which, I mean, these are both you know, finite uh, computations. Uh, in principle, there's no difference. It's just big O of 1, right? But OK, this, this is your brain on Edwards curves. Uh -huh. This is your brain on Weierstrass curves. And what does this have to do with defining E of R? Well, Here's the general setup, again, for rings of class number one. You take projective space over R to be the set of lines through the origin in three-dimensional space. So you take all, for any x, y, z, define x colon y colon z as all the multiples of x, y, z, same multiple of x, y, and z. And that's some line through the origin in three-dimensional space. And then the set of those lines is, well, I should, I should say this is supposed to be a non-trivial line in the sense that x, y, and z are supposed to generate the whole ring. Uh, take all of the, the non-trivial lines through the origin, and that is projective two space over r. And now define E of r for, say, Weierstrass form. This is what Leinster did in 87. Define E of r as, well, the set of x, y, z in this projective space that satisfy the curve equation for, say, a short Weierstrass curve. 
how do you add points? How do you add these uh, elements of E of R? Well, this is where the complete system of addition laws comes in. And you really need it to define E of R in this generality. You take the complete addition laws from, well, back in 87, Lenster's paper only had Lange Rupert to refer to. He said, take those three addition laws for Weierstrass curves, add the points that you're trying to add, the x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2, with those formulas. And that gives you three different choices for uh, lines through the origin, which are supposed to be the sum of your points projectively. And now, they're all supposed to be the same point in some sense, or maybe 0, 0, 0. But well, if r is, say, you have z mod n being z mod p times z mod q for two different primes, p and q, then uh, you might have one of the formulas is working mod p, and another one's working mod q. To, to get a, a general formula that always works, you add these three lines through the origin. And that always gives you a, a proper line through the origin, which is some x, y, z. This is the GCD computation. This is the inversion. You have to do something mod n. You have to find one generator for this module. I mean, you start out seeing it as a, as a projective module. You know it's rank 1. And because r is assumed to be <coughs> trivial class group, you know that there's a single generator for it. And that computation is exactly a GCD computation. OK, so that's the, the right definition of E of r. Uh, of course, if you allow r to have a bigger class group, then you need to, uh, to allow more terms in this, uh, not just a single x, y, z. Hookie. Next mini talk, factoring integers into primes. Here's a quote from Atkin Mohan in 93, finding suitable curves for the elliptic curve method of factorization. They said for practical application, they constructed a whole bunch of uh, curves, the elliptic curve method of factorization. You'll hear much, much more about tomorrow in Peter Montgomery's talk, uh, plus you've heard a bit about it before. Um, in the context of ECM, well, it's good to start with a curve over Q. You need to have a curve over Q with a known non-torsion point over Q. And then you'd like to have the curve having a big torsion group. And that's what this whole paper is about, is constructing curves over Q with rank known, shown explicitly to be at least one by exhibiting a point. Uh, and with big torsion groups, all the way up to the maximum you can have over Q, namely z mod 8 times z mod 2. And they say you may as well use this 16 torsion point curve, family of curves. Giving a prescribed factor of 16 while inside the context of the elliptic curve method, whatever groups you write down, if you know that they have, say, four torsion points for the, for the clock, or if you know they have two torsion points for uh, z mod n star, if you uh, know something about your, your group, then that effectively divides the size of your group by that little torsion. It improves the chances of the elliptic curve method factoring. And so they say, yeah, OK, this is the, the biggest groups we can give you. Use those curves. Except it's actually not true. These are not the best curves to use for ECM. Together with Tanya and Peter Berkner, um, this paper here is called Starfish on Strike. You'll have to look at the paper to understand the title. Uh, the result is there's sort of an expected part of this, and then there was a surprising part of this. Uh, we were looking at all the results from Hussein and Hissel that you've heard about of how fast Edwards curves, and in particular, this kind of twist of Edwards curves, minus x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus dx squared y squared, how fast these curves are. They're certainly much faster than anything you can do with uh, Jacobian coordinates or the other coordinates that have been considered for ECM, we were certainly expecting these curves to be very, very fast. And there's a little problem that these curves are incompatible with uh, having 12 or 16 torsion points. With this particular shape, the minus x squared prohibits having uh, 10 or 12 or 16 torsion points. So the best you can do is, say, z mod 6 or z mod 8. And we constructed all these. Uh, I use the word we loosely. My co-authors constructed all these. I just did the computer experiments. We were expecting that the z mod 6 and z mod 8 cases would be very fast, but would lose some effectiveness inside ECM. They don't have the maximum torsion. And everybody working with ECM knows we want big torsion. Except, it's again, it's just not true. These curves actually find more primes than the previous curves do, even though the torsion is smaller. Now, there's reasons, there's easy reasons to explain why they might find the same number of, uh, of primes inside ECM, why they might be as good in terms of effectiveness, how many primes they find, and then better for speed. And that's what we were hoping for, that they'd be at least as good or maybe not so much worse for effectiveness and then so fast that they'd be worthwhile. But actually, they're very fast, faster than anything else, and they find more primes. 
The combined effect of that is illustrated in the following diagrams, which are, this is for a thousand curves in five different families for finding different sizes of primes using parameters that were optimized for the now known to be not best possible families. Um, what you see here is taking, for example, 7,200 modular multiplications to find an average 25-bit prime. So feed all 25-bit primes to your ECM program and then see how many of the primes you find. Compare that to the number of multiplications that you took, which is maybe 4,000 for finding half the primes, comes out to 8,000 per prime actually found. Uh, the curves are then sorted in order of uh, the lowest cost curves on the left, the highest on the right. The red curve at the bottom here, the lowest cost curve, is the Z mod 6, which actually has two pieces because there are two different families that we were looking at, and they apparently have different performance despite having the same torsion and all other obvious algebraic features being the same. Uh, up here is the 12 and 16, and then some other curve shapes that we tried. And very stable as we increase the size of primes we're looking for. It is very clear that ECM is happier with these Z mod 6 curves than with the previous Z mod 12 and Z mod 2 times Z mod 8 curves. The order never changed, right? I'm sorry? The order, uh, the order does slightly change between 12 and 2 times 8. Uh, the parameters, again, were optimized for uh, a certain slice of the ECM parameter space. And then there, if you're trying to optimize ECM parameters, then you, you end up being kind of limited by the, you're, you're looking at small numbers and you have a limit to, to how many uh, different cutoffs you can use for, say, B1 and ECM and the stage two parameters. And so um, you, you often get kind of discontinuities. And so for some of those parameters, actually the uh, 12 and 16 reversed slightly. Um, but those were the best parameters found in a fairly comprehensive search for those curves. And this, just using the parameters optimized for those, is quite a lot better. So what's going on here? We don't know, but maybe somebody can figure it out. All right. Last little section of my talk. I have officially 10 minutes, but I only have a few slides. Sometimes you've been going for a while, doing some serious mathematics, and then you you kind of degenerate. And you end up saying, all right, what are all the primes up to 1,000? I'm really bored. Two, three, five. And you would think a problem like this, there's nothing to say about it because Eratosthenes figured it all out thousands of years ago. And what the sieve of Eratosthenes does is, well, evaluates, enumerates systematically all the small values of some quadratic forms. In the traditional expression, you're enumerating product. You take, say, all the multiples of 2, all the multiples of 3. You can skip all the multiples of 4. All the multiples of 5, skip all the multiples of 6. So you're enumerating products, i times j. But for lots of reasons, I prefer to re-express those products. Let's ignore what happens at 2. Just look at odd products, i times j. You can think of i as x plus y and j as uh, y minus x, and then, well, i times j is minus x squared plus y squared. y squared minus x squared is a generic way, as, again, ignoring two, ignoring even numbers. y squared minus x squared is a generic way to write an odd product, which I'll then, I, I remember a wonderful book called Category Theory Made Difficult. Um, this is a sieve of Eratosthenes made difficult, and there's kind of limits to how far you can go compared to category theory, but okay. Uh, <laughs> y squared minus x squared, that is the norm of the same kind of thing I was writing down before, y plus xt from the ring z adjoint t mod t squared minus 1. Hey, that's not irreducible. Don't worry about it. You can take norms from z adjoint t mod t squared minus 1 down to z. And in particular, the norm of y plus xt is y squared minus x squared. You take y plus xt times y minus xt, you get y squared minus xt squared, which is y squared minus x squared. So that's what the sieve of Eratosthenes is doing, is systematically enumerating norms from this uh, reducible ring. And then somehow, by knowing something about the numbers of ways to write n as a value of, of these norms, uh, it figures out whether n is prime. If you can write n in several different ways as a product, then it's, it's not prime. Um, like I said, you, you kind of degenerate after a while, but uh, it's, it's still kind of fun to look at this. Um, all right, if you do this computation for all small numbers n, say all numbers n up to h, then it's actually very, very fast. Because enumerating all the values of y squared minus x squared that are up to h, 
well, if you just take some y in some range and x in some range, then uh, you're, you're not going to get uh, any particular n with a very good chance. But if you're looking at all the n's and you just zoom through all the x's and all the y's that it could possibly be relevant, and you make a table of all the n's that you care about, and that's what the sieve of Eratosthenes does, and it's very, very efficient. But you can actually do better. I was on the way to a conference with Oliver, and uh, he mentioned that he actually uses something different to check whether a number is prime, whether a small number is prime. Namely, evaluating, well, enumerating values of x squared plus y squared, or 4x squared plus y squared, 3x squared plus y squared. OK, the complete sieve of Atkin, there's of course many choices you can make here, but what is now widely known as the sieve of Atkin is enumerating, instead of y squared minus x squared values, you enumerate y squared plus 4x squared values for some ends, y squared plus 3x squared values for some other ends, and uh, y squared, uh, well, 3x squared minus y squared values um, for some other ends. And this covers all possible ends. Now, this is better than the sieve of Eratosthenes. There are fewer values of these forms than there are of y squared minus x squared because there are fewer elements of these number fields than there are of q times q. If you take q adjoin, uh, what people sometimes call q adjoin square root of 1, q adjoin t mod t squared minus 1. It's q adjoin square root of 1. It's not a number field. It's a product of two number fields. Its zeta function is a product of zeta functions. It has a double pole at 1. You've got more ideals. You've got more elements of this number field than you do of, uh, well, product of two number fields than you do of an actual authentic number field, like the ones that are showing up in the sieve of Atkin. Q would join square root of 3 or square root of minus 3 or whatever square root you want to put in, except for square root of a square, like square root of 1. Now, as a result of that, if you ask how long does it take to write down all the values of x squared plus y squared, say it's just less time than writing down all the values of y squared minus x squared. I have a parenthetical note that I don't know the answer to, namely, uh, can you do something similar enumerating points on elliptic curves? I heard him mentioning this and said, well, that's funny. That actually answers an open question in prime enumeration. You'd be surprised how many papers there actually are on this topic. Uh, namely, can you enumerate primes in what seems to be the best time possible? Not quite h over log h time for all the primes up to h, but h over log log h is the best anybody's been able to do. That's the number of additions of numbers that are up to about h or h squared or so. Uh, can you enumerate primes with that minimum amount of time using a lot less than h space? It was previously known how to do this enumeration using something like h or h over log h space. But can you do it, some previous papers asked, in only, say, square root of h space? That was previously known to be doable only with much, much more time, like h times log log h. And well, Atkins sieve immediately answers that question. And so we wrote a little paper. And uh, then Will Galway came along and said, actually, you can do the same kinds of techniques with better lattice basis reduction, gets down h to the 1 3rd. You should be able to get this down to h to the 1 4th. But more recently, I've been looking back at this and wondering, is this actually a sensible kind of optimization to do? This is saying, we're, we're saying, go for the absolute minimum time, paying attention to like log log h factors, not willing to do h or h times log h or any such thing. And then asking, can we make these huge memory reductions, but still not willing to compromise at all in, in the amount of time? I don't actually think this is a meaningful game. I think that meaningful games are ones played on current state-of-the-art graphics cards, like the Radeon 5970 graphics card, which has 3,200 parallel multipliers, all running at 725 megahertz. It can do 2.3 times 10 to the 12th multiplications per second, draws 300 watts, costs about $600, uh, this is a picture of something running at even higher speed, doing more multiplications per second, but needs more cooling. Uh, and you have to make sure to plug it into a, an even better power supply. Now, this is the future of computation. This is the fastest computational machinery you can buy today, considering its price. It's the fastest, it's the best price performance ratio you can get for computation by far. And it's not what we're optimizing for. If you think about the 3,000 parallel multipliers here, and you try to put your typical number theoretic algorithm onto this graphics card, then you see it's actually incredibly slow. Because those 3,000 parallel multipliers, they can all operate at once with very small amounts of memory. 
They can't talk to huge amounts of memory. They can't sieve very quickly. If you tell them, oh, we're going to have a large amount of memory and just access that, it's incredibly slow. And physically, it wouldn't make sense for it to be faster. So to take advantage of this, we should be willing to trade some time for reducing memory consumption much, much further. And this is actually, yeah, go ahead. I don't quite understand. Yeah. Your output size is of length page, right? Yeah, this is not counting the printer's paper. So the, the bits of memory are, are sorry? You have to yeah, you keep spitting out of this machine the primes in order. Two, three, five. Somebody else might write them down. Sorry, say again? You have to print page Yeah, something like h bits. This is the operations are h over log log h operations, each of which is working on integers of log h bits. So the total number of bit operations is h log h divided by log log h. Now you're talking about a much, much smaller number, namely h, of bits that you have to print. Uh, it's an important question. Yeah, it's important that these are operations on. It, it, you can count bit operations as well. It takes just a bit more work. OK. All right, so back to here. And this is actually my last slide. Uh, if we want to optimize number theoretic algorithms for real computers, uh, then we really have to reduce the amount of memory we're using and even do that if it means increasing the time somewhat. A great example of this is a paper by John Sorensen a few years ago on the pseudo squares prime sieve, which always prints the primes 1 through h in order and is conjectured to take, well, h times log h operations on the log h bit integers and uses only log h squared bits of memory. And OK, nobody's put it onto this machine yet, but it will run much, much, much faster on modern computer architecture and computers of the future than any of the other algorithms that I've mentioned possibly will. I think it might be possible to uh, improve this a little bit, maybe get rid of almost a log h factor using um, elliptic curve primality tests using class polynomials and so on, putting everything together that I've said. So maybe the problem of enumerating primes is not actually as uh, simple as I once thought. In any case, even if this is the best possible, I think Oliver really would have enjoyed playing with these computers. And I hope that uh, you will enjoy in the future playing with them too. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> Dan blown, blown you away. Ah. I just wondered your conjecture on uh, proving primality, the log, the log n squared one. Are there any uh, nasty, uh, are there any, say, quadratic non residues? Is there any kind of, I need a square root of, uh, of something lurking in that, in that uh, prediction? There are tons of conjectures that are, I think, that would be harder to prove than that. Uh, and yeah, I guess that, that in particular is one of the pieces that's needed. So yeah, it's certainly relying on being able to uh, construct all sorts of stuff that we have no way to prove can actually be constructed. So yeah, I think you, you might actually be one of the culprits in uh, conjecturing that the best is log n cubed. And uh, <clears throat> this log n squared relies on many, many more conjectures than would go into, into previous stuff. I mean, this, this relies on uh, quite a bit of stuff that's way beyond what anybody can prove. But uh, nevertheless, I, I believe this is correct. I think I could even write down an explicit algorithm, which I conjecture to reliably determine the primality of n, and which takes this amount of time. Um, but of course, it's way beyond current technology to, to prove that. So, the, so you need a simple form. It's morally blocking. The actual runtime, that's the easy part to analyze. The actual runtime is log n squared times a certain lower order uh, factor. The, the hard part is convincing somebody that it actually reliably determines the primality of that. And well, that's what Oliver went on for 10 pages in his paper about uh, the linear, quadratic, and cubic tests being put together. And then when you try to put together more and more tests, then doing the analysis of when should they first fail is actually, well, again, I, I think I've done a, a reasonable first job, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm off by some noticeable factor. If it, even log squared log n, I would believe. But I, I think that the the final t, the number of tests that I need, is much, much smaller than log n. So log n to the epsilon. Any other questions? I have a question. I'm not sure if I should be asking one of the other speakers in this conference, but on that machine that you showed us, 
has anyone done a highly parallelized implementation of pairing to try and take advantage of that? So the question was whether uh, anybody's tried a parallel pairing on a machine with 3,000 uh, parallel multipliers. And I'm trying to get forward to the picture of it. I have no idea how to actually use this uh, PDF viewer. Um, flip, flip, flip. This is one of the things that reminds me that I have too many slides. Uh, I guess I, I, it doesn't really help answering your question to show the machine, but uh, I, I just think it's a really, it's really, really cool. I mean, when, I, I've never actually seen this in operation, but all the fans are supposed to be going. Um, you, don't, you don't actually have one. Uh, I have one of the lower clocked ones. I don't have, this is one of the more expensive, limited edition. It, it's so cool. I mean, it, we're, <laughs> they only produce like a thousand of them, and they run at something like 900 megahertz instead of 725 megahertz. And, and it's only cool if you have enough Yeah. Um, to answer the question, I I, um, I I do believe that there is a uh, group that has started looking at this question. I don't know if they are. Uh, public about it, and I don't know if they're happy to cooperate with other people about it, but uh, um, speaking for myself, I'm uh, mostly looking at much simpler things. I see all the interesting activity and pairings, and it's, it's very cool to watch and interesting to see how fast things are going. And yeah, if, if you believe, as I do, that these are the computers of the future, then it makes perfect sense to optimize pairings for these. Um, but if you uh, are looking for people who might have done work in this direction and would be willing to talk about it, then you might have to uh, look around for whether they're willing to say anything. What are the multiplies? There's a single precision floating point, approximately IEEE. <laughs> so about 25 bit mantises, roughly? About 24 bit mantises. Does that uh, machine double as also a cooktop range? Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, double as? <laughs> Could you cook on that machine? I, I assume you could. Yeah, you just have to take the fans off. <laughs> and so on your, you can flip back to the, to the uh, graphs you had. Oh, no. <laughs> this is what I get for promising a series of mini talks. So I, I was just curious. So, so I guess the, the, the Edwards curves with, with lesser torsion, uh, you expect Fewer hits because the torsion is, 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 is not as large, but you're being more efficient because the computations are faster. So, and, and it averages out that you're, you're, you're doing better. But how, how much, what if, how do the effects cancel? I mean, how, how, worse, how much worse is the torsion factor, and then how much better is the efficient computation? OK, so this is what I was trying to address. This is, so what you said is exactly what we expected at the beginning, namely that these curves would be faster but find fewer primes. And the actual effect is that they're faster and find more primes. But so each curve. But you're counting more mods. That's true. So this is the combined effect. So out of this, some part of the distance here is the speed up, which is some percentage. And I mean, the, the gap between like the 7250 or so and the 7500. Um, I, I don't know offhand what the answer is for this. This is showing the, the overall effect of uh, switching to the, from uh, x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus dx squared y squared with torsion, say, z mod 12 is, is one of these guys. I think this one. And this one is minus x squared plus y squared equals 1 plus dx squared y squared with, in a particular family, with uh, torsion z mod 6. Um, part of the gap here, so this, I, I, I do know for each of these that it's not a cancellation. So for each of these, it is an improvement in the uh, number of primes found and an improvement in speed. So each curve is running faster than the previous curves. Uh, you can go to the paper. It's online. It appeared at Latin Crypt just recently. Uh, and you'll get tables which say what the uh, number of primes actually found is for each of these cases. Uh, that's not what this graph is showing. So you might think that, yeah, the graph is saying, oh, well, there's a speed up, but then a loss in the uh, number of primes found. But no, it's actually there's, there's some speed up and there's an improvement in the number of primes. So that was the surprising part of looking at this, was that actually these curves are better for reasons that are still not known. You might think, if you, if you start looking at what happens with the two torsion and four torsion over appropriate quadratic extensions, then you can uh, argue why it should be as good to do these as the previous Z mod 12. But that still doesn't say why they're better. And they really are better. It's just, it's a certain percentage improvement, not a huge improvement, but it's, it's quite a surprise. Certainly something that should be explained. Uh, 
Well, small addition to this, I mean, the 2 times 4 and the 8 are far worse. Yeah, that's, that's right. So up at the top, the, uh, so these, these are, uh, you can see again multiple levels for, for multiple different families that we were actually trying. Uh, except for some sporadic curves that do substantially better, most of the curves in the 2 times 4, excuse me, most of the curves in the 2 times 4 and 8 families are worse in the number of primes found. I mean, much, much worse than uh, the Z mod 12 or Z mod 2 times Z mod 8. Uh, Z mod 6, some interesting things are happening, some of which we understand, and those could, again, explain why this is, is getting to be a little better than the previous from just being faster and about as effective. But why they're more effective, no idea. Two things. One is what's the x-axis of the kinetic graph? The x-axis is a, an inverse error function distribution. So if you want to turn a normal distribution into a straight line, then you use this distribution. The, uh, oh, sorry. This is a thousand curves sorted in performance order, and oh. the scale is chosen as Erf inverse, Erf C inverse, so that if uh, if it were a normal distribution, you would get a straight line. And then you said that uh, this big multi-chip is uh, so the. Um, oh, I get to flip back to the picture. Is the best uh, price performance ratio currently? Does this include uh, the cost of all the power you need to run it? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, how much do you pay for the power of these things? I think given the amount of computation you're getting out, even if the power ends up doubling your budget, then it's certainly worth it. Uh, in fact, depending where you live, the, the power can cost quite a bit. So in the typical, say, five-year lifetime of a machine, uh, these things don't have five-year warranties. But um, if you imagine this going for, for five years, then uh, you could easily spend as much on power as you do on actually buying it. So if you, if you buy two of these along with a regular CPU and disk and so on in a case, and you end up spending, say, $2,000 on a PC with uh, 4.6 times 10 to the 12th multiplications per second, then you could easily spend $2,000 on power. Depends where you are, how much your power costs. Of course, with solar energy, uh, in principle, you should be able to power something like this for uh, sustainably without very much area, because the sun is producing a huge amount of energy on each square meter <laughs> of the Earth's surface. <laughs> Think green. Sure. Can you come back to the picture again? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see this, all, all these lines, there's a sudden jump, and then they become flat, or it will not be flat again. Any explanation to this? Uh, no, there are some sporadic curves. So actually, OK, something we were expecting is that there would be, of course, random variation between curves. So if you're willing to say, OK, actually, I'm going to maliciously think, you know, all the numbers I care about factoring, I care about finding, say, 25-bit primes. And I'm going to pre-compute curves, which are really good at finding 25-bit primes. And so you would expect some random variation. And that's what you see the straight lines for. Now, when you see deviations, some of them are here. There's actually two different families, which are separated by this type of experiment. But some of them are curves, which are sporadic curves, which are better. And now we know that those curves are better because the same curves are, are showing up as much, much better. Well, first of all, it's, it's kind of implausible that it would be like this, uh, that you'd have such a jump, for instance, for the green curve randomly. But beyond that, the same curves are good for 26-bit primes, 25-bit primes, 24-bit primes, and so on. And that's something that can't happen by random chance. No, but I, I meant this jumps at the, the right edge. Well, the right edge, those are the slow curves. So those are the ones to, to slow away, the, to throw away. The interesting ones are the, the fast ones over on the left here. And uh, these are good families. This is a Z mod 6, not so good family, although still better than anything we can do with 12 or 2 times 8. Uh, so there are multiple families which are stratified somehow. It's, it's possible that that is something easily explainable from looking at torsion over small extensions of Q. But uh, then the, the sporadic curves here. Don't, uh, we've looked at some of those and, and don't have any idea what's making them so fast. And in general, the Z mod 6, uh, the red line down at the bottom, no idea what's making it so fast. I think we'd like to know what the sporadic curves are. <laughs> yeah, well, the sporadic ones are great. So, I mean, something like this is, is almost as good as, as the worst uh, Z mod 6 ones. And this is not a bad curve to use. Uh, just by randomly looking around and seeing which curves are the, are the best ones, um, some of them are surprisingly good. 
Any more questions? No more reluctant questions. Um, okay, well, let's thank Dan again, and then we'll resume.